many of you work with someone who's blind? Or know someone who's blind or visually impaired? So let me just ask everybody to just close your eyes for a moment and imagine what it would be like to keep up with everything that's happening around you. Or to get to work on time. OK, open your eyes and see what blind people to, are doing today. They're teachers, Olympic athletes, they're assembly line workers, and contestants on MasterChef. They are parents, homeowners, your neighbors, UN ambassadors, call center operators, software programmers. I could go on. But despite these many successes, most blind adults are still at home. There are 6 million adults who are blind or visually impaired in the US, four times the number of adults that are in wheelchairs, and yet you're more likely to see someone in a wheelchair than you are to see someone who's blind. It's been that way for a long time. And uh, as you heard, the statistics decided more than 70% of adults who are blind or visually impaired are unemployed. The world is not ready for them. And the reason that I know is I have a son who's blind. As parents, we want our kids to be independent and happy. We want them to realize their full potential. If you have a son or a daughter in college, you're probably worrying about how they're going to get their first internship. Imagine if they couldn't use their vision. We need to make the world more accessible for people who are blind and visually impaired, to help them to access information, navigate from place to place, and to find their way into our workforce and into our communities. Technology will help. Imagine the independence that driverless cars will bring. In fact, let me show you this tactile graphic here of this is, this is a, an image of the new Tesla prototype of a driverless car. The operator is using uh, a prototype of the iPhone 10 to navigate the car. And oh, wait a minute. You don't have the technology to see this slide. <laughs> mm, that's, that's too bad. Well, let me use the communication technology of the Greeks description to tell you about more of the things that are coming that are pretty exciting technologies. Um, braille dots on paper may well be replaced by electrostatic charges that feel like dots. Sounds and vibrations will be used to create three-dimensional objects. And devices like this one from Startup Ustrap, which won the Perkins Assistive Technology Prize this year at the Mass Challenge, may be a way that we navigate like bats navigate in the, in the night. Facial recognition software will reveal who else is in the room. And with the internet of things, objects will describe themselves. So the technology is pretty exciting. But technology isn't the biggest barrier. No, we sighted people are much more of an obstacle uh, out there. Um, so let me talk about some of the uh, situations we get ourselves into, because sometimes we're not comfortable with people who are blind. We're, uh, we're not sure what to do or say. So for example, if you meet a person who is blind and say, nice to see you again, ah, is that like the worst faux pas in the world? Not at all. Blind people say, see you later, uh, nice to see you again, see you at the movies, all the time. What's most important is to be respectful, ask questions and make choices, and go ahead and make your best effort. So let me give you another situation. You're at the street corner next to a person with a cane. Do you grab their elbow and say, I'll take you across the street? Not unless you want a caning. <laughs> no, better to say, would you like to cross with me and offer your elbow? Remember to create choices uh, and have a better outcome. OK, imagine you're at the restaurant, and you're sitting next to someone who can't read the menu. So hmm, what do we do here? Offer to read the menu. A lot of this is common sense. Or imagine you're not at a restaurant, you're at a potluck dinner. You could say, 
would you like him to serve you or, or do you plan to serve yourself? In which case you could describe what's on the table. Okay, one more social situation. How do you greet the guide dog? Hmm, he's so cute, but no, don't greet the guide dog. Don't pet the guide dog, don't talk to the guide dog. You wanna focus on the person who's visually impaired. Think of the guide dog as an extension of the person. So these are just some social settings that uh, I think everybody could maybe get a little more comfortable with, uh, but uh, these are mostly common sense and the stakes are actually much higher when it gets to the employment process. So now let me take you to the journey from capable individual who happens to be individually, uh, uh, visually impaired and a job. And you can imagine that there's a number of steps to getting along the way and those steps are full of human obstacles. For example, in the search process, websites that cannot be ex accessed uh, by the tools that visually impaired use are inaccessible. Therefore, they can't see the job is there and they can't read a job description. Some job requirements may not be requirements at all. Do you really need a driver's license to do this job? The more enlightened employers uh, uh, employ a process called job carving, job carving, so that you make some accommodations to the job to allow a talented person to be able to do that job. Um, if you didn't already know this, public transportation is notoriously, notoriously unreliable, and when it comes to a job, you gotta get to the interview on time and get to the job on time every day. If you can, um, you can actually get through these steps and make it to the interview itself, you now face the interviewer who is, the interviewer is kind of us uh, asking questions. And, you know, think about what goes through your mind when you're the interviewer and you first realize that the person you're talking to is visually impaired. It's the elephant in the room. You're not allowed to ask about the disability. And so, what do you do here? My advice is, Start with a presumption of competence. Open your mind and use your imagination. Let the person who's blind describe their skills and how they would handle the job. And then you can decide whether they're qualified and maybe make a few accommodations. So let me end with four things that we can all do to make the world more accessible. First, better education for young adults who are blind and visually impaired to help them make the transition into adulthood. At the Perkins School for the Blind, we go beyond academics to social, daily living, and vocational skills to prepare them for their future. We've been doing this since we taught Annie Sullivan and Helen Keller back in the day. Second, we need to make information very accessible. No PDFs, please. And make it easy to get around the office or the university, wherever they may be. Third, we need to bring uh, particularly the young adults into the workforce, create internships, streamline that job interview process, and make accommodations in the job descriptions so that we can give them that first step into their careers uh, into the workforce. And finally, we need to create more awareness of the blind and visually impaired in our community. The way that we have done with so many disadvantaged populations in our society over time. So, reach out, knock on their door, invite them out, because right now, their biggest handicap may be all of us. Thank you very much.